Good evening. Welcome to the latest of these uh, evening things. Uh, and this one's a discussion, conversation uh, on prayer, hopefully. That's what you're prepared for. Thank you to William for agreeing. Thank you for Mark for agreeing at the last moment to step in. Alex Irving was due to be with us. Uh, sadly, health issues mean that he's not here, so uh, pray for him. Uh, he's, on, I think, on his way to Cambridge this evening. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, he'll be back around sometime soon. Um, so we've got some questions that have been handed in the last couple of weeks, which we're going to uh, spend probably most of the time answering. We'll aim to go to between quarter to nine, nine o'clock, sometime, something like that. Um, if there's time after we finish with the set questions, then we'll either just have a chat or take some questions from the floor, we'll see. But I thought it could start by uh, us talking about our experience of prayer individually. So, who wants to go first? <laughs> that would be me, I want to go first. <laughs> they will talk eventually. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> To be fair, if you don't talk, I will just keep on talking. <laughs> These guys know it. That's why. <laughs> They're used to this. <laughs> God, there's something to shut me up. Um, my, wife's very th- my wife's very thankful that I'm here, by the way. Um, okay, my experience of prayer is, uh, I think, I mean, I grew up in very much in a standard evangelical tradition of those acronyms of, what are they, acts and uh, various things of talking to God and hoping that something happens. Um, but when I left home, I, I had all that completely messed up now, and I'm very thankful, um, primarily through my studies, as I've looked at different groups of Christians throughout the years. And so I'm very, th- I mean, I can occasionally still do pray, as I used to, but I'm very thankful that I have liturgical prayers at my disposal for times when I'm not sure what to say and I want something solid to say. I'm very thankful for Celtic spontaneous um, doxology kind of praise prayers but where I am probably more than anywhere else is, is with the mystical uh, prayers of quiet I'll probably be talking about that later at, at some point, more passive uh, prayer coming out of obviously my medieval period, so that's where I'm currently most happy you're next hi Um, Well, Jesus is my best friend, and I love him, and I love... (laughs) It's a hand effect, no? I love being with him. Um, So, looked at broadly, um, I'm a great prayer. Um, But more narrowly, I would say that I'm... Uh, a much more natural worshipper than I am intercessor. Um, I don't think I've ever been half as good at asking God for things as I have been at thanking and praising and worshipping and enjoying and celebrating. Um, I've recognised that for many a long year. And um, so that uh, frames really quite a lot of my prayer life, the amount of time I spend doing different things, the amount of concentration, effort, and so forth. But, um, left to myself, given half an hour alone with the Lord, I may sometimes not do all that much asking, enjoying and reflecting and praising. But then sometimes I'll have really, really concerted times of petition or intercession as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. I suppose I've, I've been dialoguing with God. I think I think I, I chat to God and listen to what He said. I suppose I've, ever since I've been a teenager, that's what I do. It's it's almost like a natural kind of relationship, and I do it sort of all the time um, in all sorts of places. Um, and over the years, I've kind of got to try and discern His voice, you know. Um, Sometimes it's easy to figure out what he's saying, and other times he's silent. Um, and sometimes I get really fed up with him and tell him so, you know. I get cross with God quite a lot. Um, like you do with, with anybody you know, because it's not always pleasant, the relationship. 
uh, God challenges me a lot. Um, and I don't always uh, really enjoy that. So I, I, I can't stand God as much as I enjoy him. I mean, it's a bit equal, really, I suppose. Like any good relationship, I mean, you, you get fed up with your friend nattering on about something that you're not really interested in or they're not listening to you. And sometimes I feel God's not really bothered. He's not really listening. So I, I, I like those psalms which, which get fed up with God I, because, because I, I, I do that. I'm so glad they're in the Bible. I'm so glad the prophets struggle with God. Uh, there's loads of scripture like that. I mean, you, you get Abraham <laughs> challenging God to save Sodom and Gomorrah. I like that. that. That's my model. I like dialoguing with God and trying to get him to do stuff. Come on, get your finger out kind of stuff. I, I do that quite a bit. Can you do something, you know? And that, that's me. Um, and I suppose it's an instinctive thing, I think, really. And, and I suppose I've always been like this ever since I really got committed to Christ at the day before my 14th birthday. I was already in a relationship with him because I was running away and I've been running away for two years, really, basically. And so my conversion was, okay, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want. That's how I became a Christian. And I've been trying to do whatever he wants ever since. But sometimes I don't like what he wants. And um, I, can, I can go through lots of moods in a day, <laughs> which is really praising the Lord and thanking him. And then, and then something crops up and I say, oh, thanks a lot. Didn't really need that. And that can swing back to praise again, you know, in the evening. So, um, mood swinger, I suppose, yeah, yeah. But the Bible's full of people who, who have those sorts of swinging experiences between praise and, and, and the, the agony of things not working out and you asking God to do stuff. And, uh, and sometimes it, it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's this ebb and flow of the relationship. But uh, I think all, all my years since that, that, you know, being committed to Jesus like, like I did that, that, that evening, I, um, I always felt good about, about God because it's, uh, <laughs> I think that's, that's how I feel, you know, sitting here at, many years later, I think it's the best kind of thing I could have done with my life is to, to, to have this relationship. I wasn't really listening, but I'm sure it was very good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Too tempting, sorry. That's disapproving look, that was. Uh, let's get into some questions and see where we go with these. So, we'll start at number one. It's a very good place to start. I'm not going to start singing sound of music. If God knows our hearts and minds, why does he need us to pray? I'll start if you like. Yeah. It's about what William said. It's the, it's the example of Jesus. If Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, why does he have to spend nights of prayer in the mountain? So it's a pretty obvious answer. If he needed to do it, then what's wrong with me doing it? You know, um, what is this thing about the incarnate Son of God needing to pray to the Father? I mean, what's that about when you think about it? I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? So um, if, if he needs to do it, in his incarnate state because he's human. That's the model for me. I'm not very good at going up mountains and spending the whole night praying. <laughs> but that's my model. Okay, I'll be all theological. Um, if God knows our hearts and minds, which God does, why does God need us to pray? Well, he doesn't. God doesn't need us. God does not need us but God chooses to cooperate with us um, Colin Dye, senior minister at Kensington Temple Word of Wisdom, I don't know if it's original to him probably isn't without God we cannot without us God will not and I found that such a useful understanding of the the nature and the activity of God and us. Without God, we can't. Without us, he won't. That's just God's choice. <clears throat> you can think of one or two things that God did without human cooperation. But um, 
probably not all that many really. And um, so I don't, I don't believe that God needs us to pray, but God wants us to pray. It is how God has chosen to operate largely in this world is with us, which is an extraordinary privilege. Hmm. Yeah, there's that response to faith, isn't it? It's, it's as, as we have faith, God, God does work amazing things. I would say, yeah, I'm going to get mystical on this one because I have to. So if I'm theological and you're mystical, what's Mark? <laughs> Argumentative. Scottish. Well, Scottish, I, I, either would work. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I would say that the question kind of presupposes uh, us being active in prayer. Um, and I'm not sure that that's where I would go. I mean, Walter Hilton, uh, 14th century guy, uh, spoke about three different kinds of prayer. One prayer which comes from the mind, from understanding God, from, from reading scriptures, which is primarily mental prayer. One from the heart, which comes from an experience of God um, and feeling God. And then the, th the third, which seems to be the, the, the deepest form of prayer, which where heart and mind cease and one is with God. And that's, that's kind of what I mean about mystical prayer. It, it is being able to still heart and mind. And this is a spiritual discipline which I, I've just actually, I, I lost it for about eight, nine years. Kids will do that for you. They don't allow you quiet prayer. And your mind just doesn't. But I, I, I now can actually still myself. And uh, the mystics talk about this sense where you're not even aware of your surroundings, you're not aware of your physical state anymore. You simply are in the presence of God. And it's, uh, it is, it's out of body experience. I mean, you, you can look at someone like Teresa of Avila or, or one of these guys. Um, and the reason I bring that up in terms of this question is because I think one of the great purposes of prayer is to um, get in touch with the mind of God, not actually divorce myself from my concerns, how I'm looking at the world, uh, how I see the world, and begin to see the world how God sees it, which is often far worse than anything that I'd ever seen. Um, and that's, that's actually what I want to do in prayer, because then I can actually have some sense that what I'm praying is what I should be praying. And in hardest times, I don't want to pray prayers that won't be effective. I want to pray, pray prayers that God wants to hear. It's a, fast, it's a, it's a tough spiritual discipline, I think. Um, but it, it, it can be very rewarding. So I think we've already answered the part, the part B of the question, which was, what, would God's good works still happen without prayer? I think you kind of covered that quite a lot. In terms of, they can, but I think that, that choosing to work through us. Mm. Well, of course, God has always got to be free in any true theology. You can't pin God down a box, I mean. Uh, so one has to got to be careful in putting conditions on God in his operations. But um, it's true he limits himself to us most of the time. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's hard for me to know because there are other people praying apart from me. And he's not dependent on me praying uh, because there may be lots of people praying about a similar thing and uh, in, in the mystery of how God runs the universe um, I can't possibly know anything beyond myself or a prayer group that I'm a member of or, or, or some kind of network that I'm part of that's the only knowledge I would have and that's <laughs> rather like being a little ant you know <laughs> crawling about um, my knowledge of what the providence of God is, is 
is, is very tiny. So um, I wouldn't want to, to, to limit the, the work of God to my prayer, for instance. Um, uh, that's, that wouldn't concern me too much, I don't think. I absolutely believe in the relationship between people praying and God answering and things happening. I really do. But I wouldn't want to um, belittle the relational aspect of prayer, that um, God wants us to pray not just because, to use the wording, the question, he needs us to in order to do things, but also God wants us to pray because God wants us to have a dependent heart and uh, a close relationship, a loyal attitude. God wants us to develop relationship. And I come back to what I said at the beginning, it's about friendship. Who is your closest friend? And uh, it's about relationship. I find that is the more important aspect of prayer than God, will you please do A, B, C, D, and E, though I fully acknowledge there's a place for that as well. I think there's, a, there's a slight thick bit of, of realisation. If, if I really want to pray something, or, I mean, if I really want to do something for my wife, for instance, you know, if I, if I really want to get her a special present, and I, I have the ability to do it, I know where I'm going get, to get it from, I know what I have to do to do it, uh, and I decide to do it, and then I don't actually do it, then I'm not sure how much... I actually wanted to do it in the first place. And if, I, if something is on my heart, truly on my heart, and I don't pray it, then how much was it really on my heart? Let's have number two. This is, yeah, I'll be interested to see where this one goes. Who should we be praying to? Should it be to the Father, Spirit, or Son? Does it matter? whom we pray to, or to whom we pray, as it should be. <laughs> you would have picked up on that, wouldn't you? Surely. Yes. Excellent. Maranatha, come Lord, addressed to Jesus in the book of Revelation. 1 Corinthians. Yeah. It's there too. It's in the end of the book of Revelation. And in <laughs> So it's not asking God to the Father to come, it's asking Jesus to come. Which is significant because most of the prayers in the New Testament are directed to the Father, it seems. <laughs> well that's why I mentioned yes, it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's important to at least state there is there is direct prayer prayer to the Son a couple of times. But I don't think there's any prayer to the Spirit mm. in the New Testament. Is mm. that right? No. And I, I think in terms of the, I mean, if you're going to get, can I be a bit uh, theological? If you're looking at the hypostatic properties of the, the three persons. <laughs> <laughs> I supervise Alex Irving. The what? This is, this is what Alex is going to get into. The, what distinguishes the persons from one another in, in how they have they are manifest. Um, it seems to uh, ask something of the, of the Father is, is consistent with who he manifests himself to be and, and likewise with the Son. Whereas the Spirit seems to work uh, as, he, as he proceeds from Father or Son. Um, so yeah, it, it seem, that, that seems to be how the economy, and certainly that's what... Um, Basil of Caesarea, um, who kind of defined our doctrine of the Holy Spirit in his fourth century work, would have said so, I think, generally speaking. Graham, I think Graham at this point would say, you don't pray to somebody's breath, isn't that right? I think uh, third year, um, yeah, I've, uh, I've had a nod. Uh, yes, uh, if, if spirit is breath, bruach, then uh, you wouldn't pray to somebody's breath coming out of their mouth, you'd actually pray to the person themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's taking it slightly further than I would like to, but Graham's voice should at least be heard a little bit. <laughs> My take on this is there's one God, we pray to God. So let's not overly divide the Trinity here. There's one God, we pray to God. Ultimately, 
I believe prayer reaches our Father, our Father who art in heaven. We're taught to pray to the Father by Jesus. I don't imagine for a minute that God condemns loving, heartfelt Christian prayer. So if you pray to Jesus, then I just see Jesus taking your prayer and passing it on to the Father. If you pray to the Spirit, I see the Spirit taking your prayer and passing it on to, oh, I'm not quite sure, directly to the Father or through the Son? Probably through the Son, actually, come to think of it. Um, but there's one God we pray to God. And I really wouldn't get here proverbial in a twist <laughs> over that. Or actual, I mean, it's just or not even worth actual, it. It's just not worth it. Which might be painful <laughs> if you're wearing them at the time. Mm. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Mm. That's a song. Is that scripture? Mm -hmm. It's a song. I've sung it several times. So it's a good it. song. It is. So I've, I've talked to the Holy Spirit. Yep. Same here. In that song. Yep. Yep. I think, actually, one thing that picks up on what Liam was saying is that there's probably a greater danger in over-theologizing who you're praying to. And I, that's when we need to, to shut our brains up a little bit and say, stop putting stumbling blocks. Because, and particularly when you're hearing somebody else pray and they pray something which is heretical type thing. I mean, that's, this is the purpose of your first year her heresy test, is to show we're all a bit heretical. Um, and rather than judging at somebody else, just, you know, God looks at the heart. That's, that's mm. where God's focusing on. Yeah. Um, I do think, though, that you should be careful when you're leading public prayer, yes. especially you who are and are becoming Christian leaders, people of influence. Please don't stand up in church and say, Father God, thank you that you died on the cross for us. <laughs> yeah. Please yeah. operate a bit more yes. of Trinitarian nous than that. I yeah. hear a lot of those kind of prayers. I'm sure they don't offend God, but they could confuse the fellow Christians you're seeking to help by leading them in prayer. Yeah. I'm wondering whether I go to praying to Mary and the saints or not. Oh, go on. You want to? Of course I want to. It's part of what I teach. Matt, not that I teach you Matt, should. should we pray to Mary and the saints? No, we shouldn't. <laughs> pray to Mary Why and the saints. Why not? Now look, yeah. I could ask oh. you to pray for me. Yes. And we would regard that as a piece of legitimate Christian yes. fellowship. Yep. So if but you, you had died six months ago, yep. why can't I continue to have legitimate Christian fellowship with you, St. Matthew, and ask you to pray <laughs> to Jesus for me? Uh, I, th I think there is a difference between those who are alive and those who are dead in terms of our access into their presence, because I, I don't think the Bible is clear about exactly what state those who have died are in. There are a number of different paradigms about soul sleep or immediate presence of heaven or purgatory or various other things. Um, and I, th I think always the, the best way is to, is to pray directly to God because that's what Christ has allowed us to do. However, I, I do think, and particularly as I, I look at uh, a lot of uh, Christians throughout history who have found praying to Mary and the saints to be held helpful. I don't think Mary and the saints actually play a particular, any particular role in that prayer. But I do think God again honours the prayers of their hearts and where the object of the prayer ultimately is the divine. I look at someone like Ans Anselm of Canterbury, father of modern apologetics, and a, an amazing Christian, wrote the book Why God Became Man, explaining uh, what happened on the cross. And yet you read his prayers and meditations, and they're directed to Mary and the mm. saints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to condemn Anselm. I want to question Anselm and say, did you need to do that, Anselm? I don't think you did. But the fact, this is, this is why we are part of one Christian community. And I don't want to jump on people and say, no, you're wrong. That's heretical. You're going to be judged and condemned for that. I want to talk to them and say, okay, well, why, why are you doing that? Why do you find that helpful? Do you, do you realize that we can enter straight into the presence of God? So I don't want to simply... Dish it. Simply say, no, it's blanket. Anybody who prays to Mary and the saints goes to hell. Because I think that's just incredibly unhelpful. I'm fascinated by why people feel that they should do that, they need to do that, rather than approaching directly into the presence of God. And, and I think mm. part, part of it is, 
is, and I think this goes back to the question again, is, is what image of God are you, is, are you bearing in mind as you're praying? And I think a lot of people who go into those churches, their fundamental concept of God that's taught in their theology, taught in their architecture, is that God is this transcendent God beyond knowing, way out there, and therefore I, I need something that I can actually engage with that God. And to a certain extent, that's why I see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When I'm wanting to, to pray to God, the great, majestic, awesome God, then I'm primarily bearing in mind Father. When I'm broken and I'm needing someone to, to, to embrace me in that brokenness, then I'm focusing on the, the Son. When I'm maybe looking for, for power, for, for life en energizing again, then I'll engage more with the Spirit. But it's the same one God, as William said, it's, it's one God. But I think the wonder of the manifestations is that it shows us the diversity of, God, of our experience of God. You see, I can easily just keep going. These guys. Next one? Right, number three. How do I know that when I pray in tongues, I am having a genuine... Just so you don't feel you have to do all uh, I'm having a genuine experience in the spirit and not simply giving in to emotion or peer pressure and faking it by speaking gibberish. Well, I think you know within yourself whether you're having a true encounter or whether you're um, sort of um, performing something for a reason uh, and it's an intuition you have. Do you I mean, speak in tongues, Mark? In a marginal kind of a way, not in a, in a, a regular way. Um, so I wouldn't say I have the gift of speaking in tongues in a regular sense, which I sense is a gift of the Holy Spirit, which seems to be slightly different from um, doing it in a, in a less frequent way. I mean, I've um, uh, thought about this a long time over many years, you know, the, what, what is the the ministry of the Holy Spirit here. Uh, I think, I think it's, 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 it's an intimacy thing, I think, for me. I mean, it's just, um, it's the, it's the groaning. <laughs> it's, it's the groaning, the inarticulate groaning. Uh, I don't think of it as speaking in an alternative language, which, which maybe I've never been able to do. So maybe there are people who speak an alternative language which they've not learned, and I'm quite happy to to hold to that view. But I've not, I don't think I've spoken a language, but I've I've spoken in inarticulate groans, which may or not be may or may not be a language. Um, so uh, it seems to me there are different experiences than possibly. I mean, I had a colleague at Birmingham Bible Institute who believed that you might be speaking the languages of angels. And that was his view, that it's quite possible that one is speaking angelic languages, because Paul seems to allude to that. And, and he held that view. That's very, very interesting. And, and um, I'm not sure uh, myself what to make of that. But it certainly was a view that he held, that, uh, that perhaps that's what he was doing. And he held that quite sincerely. So, um, yeah. So quite the, the traditional heavenly host, which is a bit, a little bit more soprano than what you hear. But, yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> Have you ever come across Zeno, uh, with foreign tongues as opposed to, to there's the two words, isn't there? There's Zenolalia and Glossolalia. One is speaking foreign language and one is speaking spiritual. Have you come across foreign tongues? Well, I've heard testimony of it often enough, but I've never actually heard... I mean, I don't know many languages. Uh, I could recognise French and quite possibly German, and that's about it. So I'm not a particularly good person to be someone who would spot another human language. But if I can offer my own yep. answer to the question, how do I know that when I pray in tongues I'm having a genuine experience of the Spirit? Short answer, by faith. Jesus taught us, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit mm. to those who ask? Which of you fathers, if your son, it's very gendered, but never mind, you follow, 
asks for a fish will give a snake. So if you ask God to give you the gift of tongues or capacity to speak in tongues and you start speaking in tongues, then it's a faith issue whether God's just answered your prayer or there's something else going on. Is it simply giving into emotional peer pressure, faking it by speaking gibberish? Um, let me say, as somebody who's been speaking tongues for the last 35 years, that actually the much greater <clears throat> problem for me is habituation just becoming habitual. But in a way, that's as much of a problem with praying in the vernacular as it is in praying in tongues. But I, I sometimes feel convicted that I'm just praying in tongues in a very kind of ordinary, perfunctory way in which I may well be using syllables that by now I have just learnt and become familiar with anyway. So in a way, it's almost become like a learnt language, oddly enough. And I take a fresh moment to ask the Father to guide my praying, that my praying might be acceptable and useful to God. Hmm. Um, yeah. Where do you stand on interpretation? Of the Where do I stand on interpretation? <laughs> um, well, I believe it's a gift, uh, 1 mm. Corinthians 12.10. Um, I believe it happens today. I have interpreted tongues myself, uh, though oddly enough, not for many a long year, which is... Oh, well, I won't bother to explain why. Um, hmm. Well, I will, yeah. It's because the sort of circles in which I move and worship have tended to move away in the last decade or two, decade or two from the message in tongues and interpretation. Much more use of corporate Godward tongues. So oh. uh, it's probably a long time, actually, hmm. since I've been in a meeting where there's been a message in tongues and interpretation. I can remember one in our local church within the last couple of years. But if I go back 30 years, it's probably happening almost every Sunday. So there you go, that's just partly why. Um, when I have interpreted, when I've heard other people interpret, I don't believe for one minute that it is a sort of mechanical translation of words, phrases, sentences. I think that it is a heart recognition that what has just been said in tongues represents what is now being said in English, or the other way around. What is now being said in the vernacular represents what's just been said in tongues. I've had experiences, actually, where I've given interpretation, where I've received the interpretation before the message in tongues has even been given. So it's, it's uh, prophetic, hmm. um, though it isn't always, I'll come back to that, um, but... I've received a prophecy from the Lord, wondered whether to give it. Then someone speaks in tongues, and I think, ah, yes, Lord, what I've just received is being represented in tongues thus, and I will say it in vernacular. It's not always prophetic. I think one of the very first public tongues and interpretation I ever heard, which was in the, the Seaford Church, the very foundational church of New Frontiers back in the late 70s, was... Much more like the interpretation was much more like listening to a psalm. Um, it wasn't thus says the Lord to you. It was about the Lord. It was it was praise. It was Godward, and it was wonderful. Mm. Yeah, and we'll this one as well. What do you think about corporate praying in tongues? Given what Corinthians says about should we oh, want time? Right. Okay. Here we go. Mini, well, I mean, it's a logical min, question min, to min, ask. Mini sermon. Yeah. Oh dear, this is going to require a little bit of... Yes, sorry about that. Um, it's a long day. Paul said to the Corinthians that if someone who's an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in and you're all speaking in tongues, they'll say you're mad. But if you're all prophesying, he will fall down and worship and say God is truly among you. Okay, now... If you're all prophesying at once, I doubt very much that he's going to come in and say, God is truly among you and worship. He's going to say, you're crackers. They were prophesying one at a time. Therefore, by analogy, presumably, the problematic behavior was that people were grabbing the metaphorical microphone and speaking in tongues one at a time, commanding everyone's attention as I now am 
without interpretation. You say, well, that's stupid. No one would do that. That's the point. They were so taken up with tongues that they were doing it in a stupid way. I think the thing Paul is criticizing is not everyone speaking in tongues at once. It's people hogging the attention of the whole congregation and addressing them in tongues without interpretation. That, I think, is what God, through Paul, is hot under the collar about. Now, I do have to admit that it says, if no interpreter is present, let the one who would otherwise be speaking in tongues be quiet and speak only to God and to himself. I do acknowledge that. And you must allow me here to be a little bit loose with the text, but trying to catch the spirit, which Paul in 2 Corinthians says is fine. <laughs> um, what does quiet mean if everyone's speaking at once? If we were all speaking in, at once in English, I wouldn't worry if my volume of my voice was about the same as yours. I wouldn't worry very much about whether you heard what I said or not. So I don't really think that it's going against the heart of the text for everyone to be praying in tongues at once at roughly the same volume so no one's commanding attention. Let me use another analogy with reference to singing in tongues, which is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14. Let's imagine it was chapel right now. We're all singing a well-known hymn, Thine Be the Glory, in English. We've got a Swedish visitor. This Swedish visitor hardly speaks any English, but happens to know the hymn, Thine Be the Glory, in Swedish, same tune. Perfectly possible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Some of the well-known hymns, the same tune, different languages. So this dear visitor sings away in Swedish. And you're next to them, and you realize they're not singing in English. Would it worry you? I doubt it. So by extension, does it really matter if they're doing it in tongues? I wouldn't have thought so. So what about if we're all doing it in tongues? Oh. Does that matter? What about if we're all singing different tunes that are in harmony with each other? Does that matter? Now, that, I've gone away from the text. I'm not exegeting 1 Corinthians anymore. I'm just trying to be logical. That's a good answer. I'd say one other thing on this uh, question. I ex extend it beyond the praying in tongues, about having a genuine experience in the spirit. Um, I would say one of the, the, the key aspects, and it goes back to the, the contemplative side, um, is to spend long enough actually understanding your own spirit. Um, because then you'll actually be able to distinguish between other spirits in interacting with your spirit. Mm. Um, I, always, yeah. I, I always give the example that, you know, John Wesley said when he, in his conversion, I felt my heart strangely warmed. He had a bit of a buzz inside. That's his conversion experience. And I grew up in that kind of idea that if I feel a, a bit of a buzz inside, then that's the Holy Spirit engaging with me. My problem was I went to the rugby on the Saturday and, and Lester would score a try and I, the Holy Spirit would speak to me. And I was really confused about what was going on. I mean, I know that the Tigers are a blessed team, but um, this is what I mean. Is, is I, I actually need to understand because in, in chapel, I get, I get, my, my spirit comes alive a lot with music. When I look at uh, people that I love, then my spirit comes alive. Now, sometimes that is simply my spirit um, being touched by, by my physical senses. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit touching me, convicting me in some ways. And I am working hard to try and discern what is my spirit, what is the Holy Spirit. And then also, when I have struggles uh, and I feel dark, is that simply my spirit? Picking down? Am I getting oppressed or I need to pray about that? Um, do I need an experience of the Holy Spirit and those kinds? So learn, learn about your own spirit. Learn what excites your spirit outside of the Holy Spirit. Then you can begin to discern when it, it's the Holy Spirit. Mm, there are other spirits as well, of course, which complicate things. Um, this is why it's complicated. And uh, in, in the end, uh, you know, even in the Acts of the Apostles, you've got the notion that people... Uh, may have spiritual experiences that don't come from the Holy Spirit uh, or even in the gospel so so that's a that's a reality which is always present with us which makes it that that each one of us has to discern I think before God what what spiritual experience is happening um, so that we're not uh, having a spiritual experience which doesn't come from God because that's quite possible to have and uh, 
if the spirits are out to seduce us away from the Holy Spirit, then we should expect some kind of struggle here. Um, and we should expect protection, a shield of God. God is our fortress and our rock. I'm not disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. just want to add the other side mm -hmm. of the picture. Well, I, the, the thing there, William, for me is that I have to be open to the Spirit's protection. And, uh, and part of the struggle of my life is, is, to, is to be wanting to be obedient to God. Because I don't always want to listen to his voice. And I want to listen to other voices. So I have to confess that all my life I've, I've been in spiritual struggle with the voices. And, um, uh, um, and, and it, the voices, uh, it's very interesting in my experience of the, 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 the voice of the Holy Spirit, if you like. I often find the voice of the Spirit coming through people. Um, and that's where I hear the Spirit most clearly. Not necessarily on my own, but when someone like Matt might be talking to me and the Spirit speaks through him. And, and it's a very lively thing. I've got lots of experience of that in my life, that rather than come directly to me, the Spirit uses somebody else to communicate with me. And since it's happened so often, uh, that's the body of Christ in a way that uh, the Spirit channels through other people often. Uh, and so when I go to church, I'm quite excited because uh, it won't necessarily be a direct experience of the Holy Spirit in church because it will be mediated through somebody preaching. And I expect the Spirit to mediate to me through the preaching. It might be through the worship leader. Um, uh, and I think I've had a lively realization that God, the Holy Spirit, has really <laughs> come to me through the weirdest people. Uh, and it's delightful, really, and the people you least expect. So wh what is, what is if, if, if speaking in tongues is, is the language the Spirit gives to you, I find he gives me that language through all kinds of ways. And it's not just when, when I'm alone in my room or something, or even in a meeting. In fact, it's often more in a meeting than alone in my room. Like in chapel here, for instance, like you were saying. But it's, it's, it's great because, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I hear the voice of God. I hear the voice of the Spirit. I hear the language of the Spirit in the oddest places. Uh, the language of the Spirit is, is a multicolored and multifaceted thing. The tongues of the Spirit are manifest. I mean, you know, uh, <clears throat> even driving up in my car tonight, you know, the, the voice of God is manifest uh, in, in, in the things I experience. Um, and I'm, I'm quite excited about that, that this is, this, is a, this is a huge, huge thing. I mean, God speaks many languages. And this is the beautiful thing about it. It's lovely to hear the, the many, many languages of God uh, and perhaps to come to speak some of them in an odd sort of a way, or at least to understand them. I just put up one more thing that you said there in, in terms of the other, other spirits, that they seduce mm. us. They're not, yeah. they're not often obviously drawing us away from God. That's, they're, they're canny. It's, it's screw tape letters type of stuff. They can be quite appealing and it's like mm. hey, should I follow this ah and that's where discretion and they often come when we're when we're weak when we're struggling with things and that's why we need to as William said hold on to the protection that we have in the early hours for me yeah when I wake up and I'm hearing the voices and I have to say Lord I'm hanging on to you <laughs> I don't like this yeah Next question. That was that was good. I thought. <laughs> Feel free to disagree. What do you do if you're angry at God about something? How do you bring that confusion, hurt, and lament before God in a way that is still pleasing and acceptable to Him? That's an excellent question. Especially the latter part. How to please God when you're angry with Him? Well, Jesus was. Jesus quoted the psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you could say, well, he's quoting a psalm, isn't he? But why did he choose it? He was angry that he had to go to the cross. 
And that was after he submitted to the will of God in the Garden of Gethsemane and got onto the cross, and then he was angry. So it's quite normal to be angry, because the son was angry with the father for making him do this. So it, it's perfectly normal um, to be angry with God in a respectful kind of way, because Jesus still respected his father even though he was angry with him. I mean, anger is normal. In any half-alive person, you're not going to take everything you get in life. I mean... So um, I've never really had a big problem with this because, I mean, it's, as I say, I dialogue with God and I, I tell him I'm fed up with what he's doing and not doing uh, and stuff like that. And I, I think that God uh, likes a good dialogue. Yeah, I think he does. I think he enjoys it because he, he, wants, he wants me to be half alive instead of half dead. He wants me to be engaged with him. He, he, he wants a relationship, which is a, which is a holistic, all-round relationship, and not some kind of namby-pamby thing where it's easy to submit because I'm just a, something to, to walk over and be abused in the name of Christ, you know, by everybody. You know, that's, that's nonsense. I don't like that kind of theology. Um, I guess that I don't particularly get angry with God, so I'm not sure I th can really offer an answer to this question. Um, it doesn't seem to be part of my experience. What do you do if you are angry at God about something? How do you bring that confusion, hurt and lament before God? I get angry but I don't think somehow that I direct that anger towards God. Appreciate that it's not the same for everyone. I do. I like Habakkuk with this. Habakkuk gets angry with God. Mm. Of course, Habakkuk gets a kick in the backside because God doesn't do what he wanted anyway. Um, so I, I think I have two stages. I, I get angry with God, and I have a good shout at him. Um, because I, I mean, he knows I'm angry. He's not particularly surprised about it, um, and he's someone who can who can take my anger. But not always. But generally speaking, after I've had a good shout, then I will try and find a place that is quiet. If I'm here, it'll be my office with a closed door, which is not very often. Or if I'm at home, I'll find a space or I'll, I'll get out. I love nature for this. Try and find somewhere. And I will, I will still myself. I will hand my anger to God. And I will still my heart and my mind. And I will wait and hear what God wants to say to me in that anger. It's the same with grief. Same with when I, when I get hurt personally or when, I, when I'm frustrated about disasters or, or other people who are hurt. I will, I will cry, I will weep before God, but then I will still myself and I will say, okay, God, how do you see this? Hmm. And often he's weeping as well because God is upset by brokenness in creation. And then I've, I'm, I can be broken with, with him. Sometimes he's angry at things that I'm angry at. Sometimes he's not. Mm. And I can say, okay, let's actually then take some action to try and correct the situation. But he honors, I think he honors my emotions. But it, he also wants me to understand how he sees things. I would say, there's, when there's a natural disaster, I always struggle at church because someone always stands up to pray for them and says, you know, there's this natural disaster going on and we don't know how to pray for it. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, I know exactly how to pray for it. The Bible tells me how to pray for it. We weep. We, you know, we gnash our teeth. You know, this is how, this is God's perspective of brokenness. Trouble is we're English and we can't do those kind of things. Not respectably. Was Jesus being literal when it came to when it came to saying? Apparently, he's 
unpersonalized it. Uh, if you tell a mountain to jump, it will. Have you ever tried it? What does it teach us about faith? I used to live in the mountains. Yep, tried it. Nope, didn't work. Could it work? Yep. Could work. But there would have to be a reason within God for actually making a mountain jump. He doesn't, he's not, he's not a complete showman. He's a bit of a showman, I think. But not a complete showman. Do you not think? I think he loves it. I think he loves performing miracles. <laughs> Not necessarily mo- jumping mountains, but yeah. So how does Jesus feel two minutes after healing someone? I think there's a buzz there. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question, really. Yes, what, what you was, what could be was, constructive. What was the question? I completely forgot the question. <laughs> What's just been literal when it came to uh, saying, yeah. to a mountain jump? Have you tried it? What does it teach us about faith? I mean, this is the thing about Jesus, isn't it? These sayings which uh, um, just turn everything on its head. I mean, he's full of that, isn't he? And this is just another one. There's a whole string of things it, of, that Jesus says which are impossible in the real world. It's, it's easy enough to, to make it a metaphor, isn't it? But I don't think that's the point that Jesus is getting at. Because any fool can turn it into a metaphor and then you take faith out of it, don't you? That's not the point. And this is where it gets difficult. Because, again, it's, it's, it's this thing about God's freedom. Jesus is teaching the freedom of God in all of these things. Don't make presumptions about God and that you know how he acts. Don't be presumptuous. And be like a child. What's this thing about being like a child? Yeah? Become like a child to enter the kingdom of God? What's that about? It's the same as expecting mountains to move, because that's what children do. Children believe in that, but adults don't. So the kingdom of God is believing that mountains move because adults don't. So you have to give up being an adult and you have to become like a child, Jesus says. And that's impossible for you and me because we don't want to be like children, yeah? Uh, and so this is what... Faith is incredibly difficult for me because, because I have to deny my own maturity as a human being. I have to go in reverse and go backwards all the time. And I find that very difficult with God. He's always asking me to go into reverse and... It's such a challenge. And this is where theology is, is going to provide another challenge to you. Because you're going to start to theologically analyse whether God's going to perform a miracle and what happens if he does and what happens if he doesn't and all this kind of stuff. And it's actually going to take you further away from the miraculous. Potentially. Because you, you, there's a danger of getting away from a childlike faith. You have to be able to preserve a childlike faith. Um, it's why I love... The church I'm going to at Croxley, I've decided the first ministry that I'm going to get involved in there is, is the creche. Because that's where I need to be on a Sunday morning. I need to be with the babies who will simply get upset, bang themselves, and turn to me and say, you make it better. You sort something out. And we need is to that, that because you're such mature adults? But, but we... wait, I, I, I have to take the section with Mark, exception with Mark, we all want to be like adults. So I think I'm fairly well disproving that rule. As, as well oh, as I can. Right, okay. <laughs> I haven't had my tenth birthday yet. I'm still allowed to be a child, uh, quite frankly. Well, you'll find this a lot easier, I suspect. Yeah, there you go. But, but easier than me, the m- moving mountains thing. No. Well, I, I still have this. I still have this mental block. I don't think it's surprising that we don't see as many miracles in the West as they see in in other countries around the world, where there is just this much simpler. Because God responds to, to faith. You know, this is. This is Jesus going back to his hometown and not being able to perform miracles because mm-hmm. people there just thought he was Joseph the carpenter's mm-hmm. son. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. an incredible mm-hmm. thing that Jesus was, was limited in that way by, by the faith of the people. Yeah. And we don't, so many of us don't believe that, that God's going to perform miracles. And if we don't believe, he's not going to do them. 
Well, I agree with you, Matt, there, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is, it's a fascinating conundrum, this, that, that, that God seems to depend on our faith to do things, and William was saying something about that in prayer, that the function of prayer is to elicit our faith, our childlike faith, so that when, when I do ask for something, he wants me to ask for it in total dependence and total belief, which is quite challenging for you to, to get to, I think, yeah, but as Jesus, an adult. But Jesus absolutely doesn't seem to want to make us feel bad about yeah. how small our faith is. He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you <laughs> tell, tell yes. this mountain to be cast into the heart of yes. the sea. That's what he actually says. Yeah. And that's when the disciples have just said, Lord, increase our faith. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that <laughs> prayer seems to be no. You don't need any more faith. And I find that really hard to yes. get hold of. Maybe my faith's even smaller than a mustard seed, but it doesn't seem as... Yeah. It, and I'm sure you feel the same. It, we, we feel that our faith is not sufficient. And Jesus doesn't agree with that diagnosis. He doesn't say that's the issue. It's having oh. faith at all is what the point of that is. He's saying you don't have any. That's the problem. You don't even have the mustard seed. Uh, and, and, and that's the difficulty for all of us, I think. I think for all of us, faith is the hardest thing. Constantly struggle to have faith in God. It's a constant spiritual battle for me to trust God for things. Um, that's, my, that's my confession before you. It's, it's a constant struggle to actually expect something from God and to name it, you know, uh, and to expect it in prayer. So I, I often find myself reluctant to ask because... Because I know I don't really believe in it, so I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to waste his time. You know, I, so that's, you know, this is my constant daily, daily dilemma. Have I got the faith to ask for this? <laughs> no, I don't, so I'm not going to ask for it. Until that, I've got the faith. It's that rationalism which just is constantly getting in our, our way. Um, we have to, to stop trying to analyse well, what happens when we ask? I'm going to keep going. I think we should just get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting one. When we pray, how do we find the balance between what we want, Father, take this cup from me, and what God wants, not my will but yours? Who said, love God and do as you please? Supposed to be Augustine, wasn't it? Yes. Did he really say that? Does it matter? But the, 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 <laughs> the idea behind it is so wonderful. If you love God, then your heart, your will is attuned to God's will. And with respect to the person who wrote the question, that it, it, it may not really be quite fair on Jesus to suggest that, that his resist uh, forgive me I, I'm, I'm digging a hole for myself now because the question I may not even have it's the way I've read the question Jesus may not in any sense at all have been resisting the will of God in Gethsemane yet not my will but thine be done it's, it's kind of sounds a bit like that there's Jesus' will and there's the Father's will but Jesus' will is to do the Father's will, isn't it? I've come to do your will, O oh God. It's written about me in the book. And uh, if anybody has a heart after the will of the Father, it's Jesus. Mm. And so let's give our will to God. That God can mold your will so you want the things that God wants. Don't try to want anything other than what God wants. What on earth is the point in that? Just let God mould our will to be after the will of the Father. I think that the, the problem is the old, old problem of time. Oh, you want what God wants. It, I think it, it takes, takes education, but it also takes time with God to learn God's will. 
to, and it's the same with any relationship. You get to know someone better, the more time, and the more intimate the time gets, the more you understand them. And the big question is, if I look at how I use my time, how important is God actually to me? And there's, there's the other question with this, which I sometimes ask, which is, do you f how do you find time with God? If you've got a half an hour in the evening, and just, just to relax, how likely is it that you're going to spend that time with God? Or is that a bit of hard work? And actually, if it's leisure time, it's free time, you know, I, you know I, I'll set aside time for, to be with God because I have to, because, you know, I'll work with that. But if I want half an hour, then Big Bang Theory's on, and I'll go and watch that. It's a bit different. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's... How do we find the balance between what we want and what God wants? I don't know if the word balance is much use, really. Because <laughs> in, the th in the thick of things... Uh, it, what is the will of God? I mean, for me, I mean, all through my life, the will of God has been a teasing kind of thing to discover. I mean, uh, you know, I have to confess that... Uh, um, I'll give you an example. Um, I agreed to preach uh, in my church on the 2nd of November in the, in the preaching team. I'm on the preaching team, and about four months ago, I agreed to take that Sunday service. November the 2nd, at Rysel Baptist Church down the road. Um, um, and uh, <laughs> as we get nearer the date, Mick Ledden comes to me and says, you're down to preach on November the 2nd. I said, yeah, Mick. He says, I'm running the service. Great. He says, we're going to do a remembrance for World War I. He's an ex-serviceman. Uh, I've got the, the, the teenagers involved. And, you know, it's great you're preaching, Mark, because you'll be really good on World War I. I said, oh, thanks, Mick. That's, that's really kind of you. So then I discovered the will of God for me was to preach on World War I, even though it wasn't my choice. And I instinctively, I instinctively heard the voice of God, Mark, you do that. Because in, in my spirit, I was about to say to Mick, I'm not sure if I want to. And I heard the voice of God. It's a brilliant thing. I heard the voice of Mark, don't say that. Say yes. Do it. And I said, yes, Lord, okay. Uh, and, and I said to Mick, yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> and, and I did it on the 2nd of November. It, and let me tell you, it was not an easy thing, as you can imagine. In fact, I scripted my sermon and read it out, which I've not done for about 30 years. The last time I scripted a sermon and read it out was about 30 years ago, because I don't really, uh, I use bullet points for preaching, because um, I don't give lectures when I preach. Um, um, and, and, and so I just felt I had to organize it so carefully, because I didn't want to offend anyone by anything that I said. Um, was World War I the will of God? <laughs> See? Was it the will of God, World War I, was it? Of course it wasn't the will of God. But what's the point of standing up there and saying that to people? Because that's not why you're doing the blessed service, is it? But preaching's truth-telling, yes? At least it is to me. So what was the will of God for all those people who died? 791,000 British men died apart from all the people from all the other nations. And I was giving all the statistics and everything. Uh, and, and it was an intensely difficult thing. What is the will of God when you're even retrospectively looking at things and you're, and you're trying to preach about it 100 years later? You know, uh, it's been one of the most testing things I've done for a long time. And... Uh, I, I, I still struggle. I still struggle with that, you know, because we're remembering something that wasn't the will of God and uh, and that, that was desperately wicked and evil. But you have to you you have to sort of discern that God was in it, and God is in these evil things, uh, redeeming people in it, um, remarkably. Um, what's the balance between what? Balance between 
what, God, what we want and what God wants. See, I, I did it because God told me, you preach, Mark. Okay, Lord, thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. It's not what I wanted to do. But I felt I had to do it, and uh, I felt I was being obedient, and, and I think I honoured all the people who suffered in what was not the will of God. They, they, they went into something that was against the will of God, and they suffered for it. <laughs> the whole of Europe and the whole of the world suffers by doing the devil's work, yes? Because that's what it is. <laughs> but, but this is part of the problem with the will of God. The will of God <laughs> has to work with, within the, the, the devil's work because the devil is so powerful. And God allows that, yes? And somebody has to redeem it. But sometimes he can't. A lot of people lost their faith in Europe as a result of the First World War. It was a huge crisis for the European church. You read any modern church history and you'll get that analysis. Where was God in the First World War? Yeah? What was the will of God? Yeah. And so, you know, I, that was just the other week. It's happening all the time, you know. And you, <laughs> you can't just sort of walk along and say, oh, there's a wonderful balance between these things. That's a lot of nonsense. If you go into the real world and serve in the real church, you know, you're going to get these things all the time. And you won't know what to do with them half of the time. And, and, you'll, and you'll be broken by it. And Christian ministry and public ministry like that is a thing that breaks you to pieces. And I feel it in my bones. I mean... And yeah, of course you could ignore it, you could ignore all of that and <laughs> try and pretend that the devil's not at work and there's no problems, you know. But that's, that's a fairyland ghetto church, isn't it? I don't want to be any part of that. And I wouldn't want you to go out of LST to be in some kind of fairyland where everything's going to be great. You know, you're going to be put on the line and, and, and just like Jesus was put on the line, you know, <laughs> with the crucifixion, wasn't he? Because I don't share William's view, you can tell. I have a different theology from William on, on Jesus and the Garden of Gethsemane, totally different theology, which is brilliant because you have to struggle with, with us giving you different <laughs> theologies. Because I think Jesus really did not want to die. So I read it differently. And he really did sweat drops of blood in that sense. But he really did then submit to the will of God. And uh, I feel that very deeply that that's what happened. And I've just mentioned what he said on the cross. Because he was angry with the Father on the cross. Even after he submitted. Uh, and I, I, I think that this is, this is one of the biggest, biggest problems. This thing about balance is a lot of rubbish because there's no balance anywhere. I really don't think so. I think it's, as the Scots say, a ser fecht all the way. It's a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle all the way. And you can get into comfort zones, but I don't think there's a balance because I think this world is a really pretty rough place. I didn't live in the Muslim world for nothing. <laughs> yeah? There's, there's, there's another one. Now you, can, you, can, you can sort of try and get yourself into a kind of uh, place where you avoid trouble, yeah? But it will catch up with us, won't it? Uh, and then we have, to f- we have to stand up and be counted then and fight the spiritual battle and try and find sense in meaninglessness, which is true for a lot of people. I think one thing I pick up on that is this whole idea of, of, of God's will for my life as if it's something which is absolute and set. And I think there's a danger in making God lineal. He's predestined my life and every step is, is seen in advance. I don't think that's a particularly helpful way of, of looking at things because then if I wander off the path then I've surprised God. And um, I think there are certain occasions when God directs us very, very clearly about things that we do but fundamentally God is a relational God. He's wanting us to relate to him um, and he, he's not a controlling God who is going to to decide everything. If he was, the world wouldn't look like this. Oh, it's a funny kind of control if, if you hold that view. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> it's a funny kind of control, exactly. 
I mean, this is the, this is the struggle we have when 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 bad things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm not. It's not. It's not just me and God. No. There are things affecting what I do, impact what I do. I can do something brilliant and wonderful for God, but other people can be impacting everything that I do from outside. I, it's not just me and God. Ev everything is intertwined. The whole of creation is intertwined. Um, and, and, so, and so I can't foresee everything which is going to happen as a result of, of my faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Very difficult questions, these ones. You got any? Any other thing I would say? John Stott told me always to write out my sermons fully. And do you? I do. I, I'm the opposite to you. I write out all my sermons, but then I practice them so I don't actually have to read them. Oh, you don't read them? No, I, I, practice, I always practice four or five times. So that, I, A, I know it makes sense, and I can, I can edit bits out which don't actually flow. Uh, and B, I can actually deliver them so I'm looking at the congregation rather than looking at my notes. Well, that's what I do, because I, I work on my sermon before I preach it. So it's the same effect. My lectures are different, though. My lectures, are, I occasionally have notes. <laughs> More rarely look at them, but yeah. We come out of them different angles, we do, but actually yeah. it's the same result. Isn't that interesting? We preach extempore, but it's all up here for both yeah. of us. Yeah. It's just that he writes it all out and I don't. Yeah. I think it all out. He writes it all out and I think it all out. And then have bullet points just to help me to keep to time. What do you do? Write it all out or...? Listen to the it's very rare spirit I goes. write any sermon notes at all. I would say for the last 20 years, the great majority of sermons I've preached, I've had no notes at all. But do you think it out, William, beforehand? Sometimes. <laughs> ah, so it's different again. That's really well, good. Well, usually, usually, usually I do, yeah. Hmm. yeah. But not down to the, the words. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Then I had another challenge, which was in ba when I was in Belarus, I would turn up to a church on a Sunday morning, and they'd say, ah, Matvey, Matvey, you're here, you're here, you're preaching, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is always a different task. <laughs> but then I prayed, this is a good lesson. This is slightly off topic. Uh, in Belarus, I would always preach with translation. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned, everyone should, should do some preaching with translation, because the one thing about preaching with translation is when you start a thought, you have to finish that thought before you go on to the next thought. Mm -hmm. Because in language, you can't go for subclauses because in some languages, you don't get a verb until the end, you fin yes. finish things. Yes, that's right. That's and right. so it's kind of left completely hanging if you don't actually yes. start a thought yes. and then finish a thought. Yes. And if I have other thoughts, I have to package them away and get to, get to them in time. And you can tell so, some people who've never thought about doing this and they go off on tangent, 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 and you're like, just forget about it. I'll make some notes on something else. Yeah. Last one uh, on the written ones. Does Christ intercede on behalf of unbelievers? Yeah, okay. Um, this is interesting because the idea comes from Hebrews. In fact, I looked up the text uh, mm. this afternoon having had the question. Uh, and so Christ is interceding for us, says the author to the Hebrews, speaking of the, of the body of believers. Um, that's the only place in the New Testament where you get this concept, so uh, it's a very specialized idea. Um, it's one of these trick questions, isn't it? Don't we love trick questions? Because I'm an unbeliever half of the time anyway, and he's interceding for me when I'm unbelieving. You see, I swing in and out of faith. Um, and I think, if you think of Peter, get behind me, Satan, that doesn't come from God. And that's the chief disciple so where was Peter was he in faith or was he in unbelief he was in unbelief and he's a disciple and we expect that in the church, the church is full of unbelief it's full of people saying unbelieving things and yet they're in the body of Christ so this is a trick question what is the body of Christ and who are the believers I mean, if you go back to Augustine of course You've got the famous idea that the true believers may be outside the active church and the unbelievers may be inside. Only God alone knows. Now, there's a lot of safety in that belief. I've always thought of the wisdom of Augustine in saying that. Um, uh, and I think that in the end of the day, 
There's a lot of unbelief in the body of Christ, and Christ is working like bilio to get people to believe. So where are the unbelievers? They're all over the place. LST is full of unbelievers, because we all get challenged, and we're all in unbelief every day, until we get into belief. Are you sitting in unbelief right now? You might be, I might be sitting in unbelief. Because I'm thinking thoughts that are wrong, like Peter was. <laughs> I'm saying, oh God, you can't do that. Or God, you can't say that. And of course he can. But I don't have the faith, you see. And so it's part of my spiritual journey uh, to, to think, am I being like Peter? I'm speaking the words of Satan. And yet I'm in the disciple community. Uh, no, it's a trick question. Because everybody's an unbeliever at some point. Even being a believer doesn't mean you're always a believer, does it? Hmm? Otherwise, you're a perfectionist and you never fall into unbelief. You, you never get tempted. You never fall into temptation. You never fall into sin. Sin is unbelief. Sin is disobedience. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is not faith. So unbelievers, we're all unbelievers. The church is full of unbelievers. Stupid question. <laughs> Who asked it? <laughs> of course he's interceding for unbelievers is, is the answer. Yeah? I'll, uh, I'll leave you to discuss Christian perfection with John Wesley. He's got other views on that. Uh, you want to take another line on the question? Because I'll, I'll take a different line, but you'll take a different line as well, I guess. Well, if I take the line that was probably meant by the person who posed the question, the, 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 the non-Christian, the Christ rejecter, <laughs> Does Jesus intercede for them? Absolutely. Wow. How could they become Christians without the intercession of Christ? Yeah, I think I, think I would support that. I would also say, I've, I mean, you're talking about Christ's intercession, that's, that's that which happens before the, the Father. I would also kind of extend it out to the work of the Spirit in unbelievers, that there's, there's the Holy Spirit absolutely works in the lives of unbelievers. Um, it's Holy Spirit's job to, to, do, to do grace. And I think he absolutely does engage with unbelievers. Has to, other, otherwise, as William says, there's no way of drawing them into, into Christ. It might be that this person is thinking about um, Christ asking the Father to forgive the unbelievers yeah, without them having an encounter with Christ or something. I mean, you do get that kind of view, don't you? That, uh, that perhaps people will meet Christ after the resurrection and they'll get a second chance to come to faith. I don't know whether that's behind this. There's been a lot of discussion about that in more recent theology, which uh, is, is the sort of thing where uh, it, it, within Catholic theology it's been a constant debate but modern Protestant theology has been catching on to this <laughs> interestingly you know um, and, and so that's a teasing question isn't it trying to, trying to figure that out and, and some people find comfort in the thought that you get a second chance after death um, and because Christ is interceding for you, and, and he will in, advocate for you at the day of judgment, even if you didn't really uh, believe in him. And there are a lot of Catholics have taken that view. It's, it's something that goes, and Protestant <coughs> tradition has been very, very reluctant until recent times to, to embrace that. So that's a very interesting question. But Possibly because it's been too overly Pauline and, and hasn't borne in mind. I mean, I always come, when I have that discussion, I always go back to, to Abraham and try and work out how on earth Christ engaged with Abraham when Abraham had no knowledge of Christ or anything that begins to approach to a, the Christ act uh, and yet he's able to in, have faith. Well, become, I, I think the Holy Spirit's better here. I mean, yeah. the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's more helpful to think that the Spirit is striving with all human beings because we're all made in the image of God uh, and therefore everybody who's ever lived is having a dialogue with the Holy Spirit. And it will be by, 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 by definition of being human. We're all inspired as well. We are, bre we are bre breathed spirit. into. I mean, that's why yes. we have spirit, yes. because we yes. are breathed into. You know, uh, and, and so every human being does respond positively to the spirit at some point and, 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 and obviously can respond neg negatively. Um, uh, and I think, I think that that's an, a better way to look at it than 
Christ's intercession, if we're thinking yeah. about the non-Christian world, uh, I, with you, would prefer to talk about the work of the Spirit uh, in dialogue with the human spirit. Where are we at time with? <gasps> Five to nine. Closing remarks, gentlemen. You look closed already. <laughs> Don't stop praying. Amen. We are closed. <laughs> <laughs> hey.